it was, it was a substantial win. McCain won 57% of the vote, just as he won 50% of the white vote. If you put those two statistics together, just flash back in your mind's eye to the town hall meetings you saw and to the protests uh, you've, that we saw on Capitol Hill and other cities, the Tea Party protests. So now I'll ask you to think about something. If you are 70 years old today, you were born in 1940. There, uh, America was still a legally segregated country. Hawaii was not a state of the Union. When you were 21 or 22, you heard John F. Kennedy say America is engaged with a twilight struggle against the forces of darkness, which were the Soviet Union. You grew up in an America that is entirely different from the one we inhabit now. Uh, does anyone remember what John F. Kennedy said when he was told that African-American diplomats were being stopped as they drove up the highway from Washington to New York? He said, why would you use that road? He said, there's a much better way to get up there. He said, that too many traffic stops there. It was his brother, Robert, who actually turned him around on, on civil rights. If you are a member of that cohort, and there are many here who are, um, you might be given certain ideological predilections. You might be more susceptible to the argument that the president right now isn't really a citizen of this country and doesn't really deserve to have the office he does. It might be an instinctual reaction. I don't know that how fully reasoned and argued it is, but something different has happened. And that's part of the reaction you see. Um, there was a great, uh, much celebrated comment, this is the last thing I'll say, uh, during one of the early town hall meetings when a very conservative Republican, Bob Inglis from South Carolina, meant to meet his constituents, and one of them stood up, this is the beginning of the healthcare debate, and said, keep your government hands off my Medicare. Right, does everybody remember that? And many, including my very brilliant colleague at the Times, Paul Krugman, sort of mocked this and pointed out that, well, of course, as Representative Inglis did, that Medicare is a government program. And that's what he said. So he said, sir, um, your, your Medicare is a government program. But I think that really misses the point. The point is not necessarily whether an individual citizen knows who administers his Medicare. The point is that we're all, dare I say it, wards of the state. Um, it is impossible to make the argument any longer, although uh, ideological conservatives will, that we can have less government. Two of the most conservative presidents in modern history were Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush, and the government grew enormously under both in expenditures and in the size of the bu bureaucracy. There is no way to make it smaller. So that becomes what Walter Lippmann called a symbol in our politics. It becomes a way to say something else. And the senior citizen who knows he depends on the government for his Medicare and fears that Medicare may somehow ch change in a way detrimental to him because some of it might go to those other 15% of the population who don't have it worries about his powerlessness in the face of government. It's not a totally irrational thing to say. So what I would ask all of you to do as we watch these next months unfold is those of you who are conservatives, remember there is a counter conservative tradition, the tradition of, of the Buckleys and Chamberses, which acknowledge the actual um, transformations that occur in our culture are not the doing of a governing elite, but of the, the very vital, at least in its good days, and vibrant uh, uh, capitalism that drives, the, uh, drives us forward. And those who are liberals, not to accumulate as many counter arguments as you can to conservatives, but do what I think Barack Obama is actually very good at, maybe to his detriment, and that is actually figure out what the other side is saying, what they might mean behind the words they speak, which might not be as eloquent or as familiar in the vocabulary.
as you're used to. Um, that none of that is going to solve the problem we have of a deadlocked legislature. Um, I'll be interested to hear in particular uh, what uh, Mr. Schramm has to say about this, because I think we, have, we don't have a real precedent for curing this, because uh, we're so you, we have so long a history of bipartisan accord that now that we've moved in this other direction, we may end up in a situation uh, that actually two of our great previous presidents contemplated. In uh, 1944, Franklin Roosevelt proposed that the parties be realigned altogether, that there be a liberal party and a conservative party, and he would join forces with uh, re moderate Republicans to form a new party. And of all presidents, Dwight Eisenhower considered exactly the same thing in the mid-1950s because he was being opposed by conservatives within his own party that he would actually break the parties apart and try to start them on a different course. We may be headed in that direction now because we're at a moment in, in, right now where the James McGregor Burns uh, sequence has been entirely muddled. We now have a president who is to the right of his congressional Democrats and we have con likely Republican establishment figures who might run for president who are going to be somewhat to the left of their own party, but that party is, uh, in Congress is going to drive their agenda. So all our politics has been turned around, and I think this is actually the cause, or at least a symptom of the confusion we have right now, and I wish I had an answer for it, but I don't. Thank you. Now, David, do you want to get? Should I sit at the end here? Sure. Why don't we all come up? Well, let me let me give some uh, very very brief introductions. Uh, first, Ellen Shaw. Ellen, as you know, is the dean of the Robert F. Wagner Graduate School of Public Service, one of the top graduate schools of its kind in the world, a former legal aid criminal defense attorney. She's a former commissioner of the New York City Department of Juvenile Justice and a leading advocate of child protection. Bob Schrum, a senior fellow at the Wagner School, is a political strategist who served as senior advisor to the 2000 Al Gore presidential campaign and to the John Kerry, John Edwards presidential campaign in 2004. Described by the Atlantic Monthly, among others, as, quote, the most sought-after consultant in the Democratic Party, Bob has appeared in Slate, The Huffington Post, TheWeek.com, and for a great political read, I recommend his recent book, No Excuses, Concessions of a Serial Campaigner. Uh, Sam, let, let me ask the first question, if I may. Uh, you are very familiar with the historian Richard Hofstadter, having written quite a bit about him. Hofstadter wrote that populism in the 1870s and 1880s was in fact a movement driven by status anxiety, irrationalism, anti-Semitism, conspiracy theories, and the like. Most historians today believe that Hofstadter was dead wrong in talking about populism in the 1880s and 90s. I was wondering if you think he's dead wrong in talking about what we consider to be right-wing populism today? Well, it's a very good question. I think about Hofstadter a lot, and um, he's in uh, my book. Um, I think Hofstadter got much right. Uh, the important thing to remember about Hofstadter was he was looking at populism through the experience of Joseph McCarthy. We know this, and you wrote a great book about Joe McCarthy. And he was trying to explain how, a, how uh, a demagogue of this kind could arise to power so, short, uh, so soon after the New Deal. And so he looked back to the sources, you know, William Jennings Bryan and other populists who seemed to share some of the same prejudices. What is different about the populism today is, remember, the Hofstetter argument about status anxiety described it really as a purely cultural phenomenon because the 50s was a time of, of great prosperity when he, you know, he wrote uh, his book, um, The Age of Reform, published in 1955. Um, we now live in a time of economic anxiety, and Hofstadter, who had uh, come of age in the 1930s and been somewhat radicalized and was himself, as you know, a you know, reader of the 
previous generation of progressive historians still kind of had the belief that the only politics that really mattered was, was over economic, competing economic interests. So in that sense, I think he would have taken this new populism seriously because much of it is about the economy. It doesn't mean the arguments are any more rational, but it is about the economy. What Hofstadter got right, and um, I, as you, I wrote a very long piece about him um, in uh, the book review, which I edit, which my colleague Barry Goon, who's here, assigned to me. Um, and it was, it was admiring of Hofstetter, but I thought at the time that he had overplayed the role of resentment and grievance in our politics, that he saw politics as almost a purely negative response to what the force in society. That, I now think, is the most important thing he got right. right. <laughs> Um, that politics has become the theater of our discontent. Uh, something else Hofstetter saw, I quoted in my book, very brilliant thing, he wrote this in 1954, is he said, politics has turned into continual entertainment. Um, it's on television all the time. He was thinking of the Army McCarthy hearings, which you describe so well in your book. Um, and so the individual who observes politics on television or reads it in the paper, listens to it on the radio, actually thinks he is now a player in it. He is something personally at stake in the politics of our time. And now all of this has been speeded up, you know, so dramatically more. But I think he saw that, that it was mass communications that would change the means of our politics. Uh, one last thing, let the other uh, panelists speak, is when we compare uh, Lyndon Johnson's great accomplishments in the 1960s when he was able to force through this you know, important legislation, uh, uh, two civil rights bills, 64 and 65, and then Medicare in 1965. None of this was publicized. It was all done behind the scenes. It was twisting arms. It was cutting deals. When Barack Obama cut a deal right, with a senator, uh, for, you know, from uh, Nebraska, when he turned it over to the Baucus Committee, all this was instantly publicized. So there was almost no way to uh, conduct politics in that, that older manner. I'm sure Bob Shrum has much to say about that. Your turn. You don't have to talk about John Edwards. No. It didn't happen. No, actually, I was going to say, I can't <laughs> believe that we ran with a guy named John Edwards. Uh, uh, and uh, I should announce that I'm not a conservative. Uh, I'm a liberal. But having read Witness a long time ago, uh, I always found Whitaker Chambers an admirable figure. And I felt uh, vindicated in that view when I read the book. Uh, the, what's happened at the at the Congressional, look, Lyndon Johnson made a deal. We were talking about the deals. He made a deal with the doctor's lobby, and John will probably remember this, to make Medicare a fee-for-service program, which actually made it cost far more money than was estimated at the time Congress passed it. No one even paid the slightest attention mm -hmm. to this, let alone understanding what its consequence was. I suspect that this communications revolution really began with Franklin Roosevelt, who was one of the great entertainers of all time. I mean, you could still listen to, like, those 36 re-election speeches, and they're absolutely extraordinary, uh, not only as political documents, but as pieces of theater, as pieces of comedy, as pieces of ridicule. Uh, and John Kennedy took that another step uh, uh, with his capacity to exploit television. Now, everybody can be on television. And everybody can be part of this communications process. So I think it's very difficult to make the system work the way it used to work. And I think you're entirely right about the importance of Dole using the filibuster four times in 1993 on a relatively modest stimulus bill, which actually, as it turns out, wasn't needed. The economy was already very much on its way to recovery. Uh, and it's a change in Congress the, this use of the filibuster that's inherently conservative. It's certainly immobilizing. The reason I say conservative is because a lot of what conservatives want to do, for example, cut taxes, uh, can be done through the reconciliation process, which is a filibuster-free zone. And on the other side, generally, they don't want to do things. So it makes it, I mean, at least a certain element of conservatism doesn't want to do things. Uh, I, I think FDR, I was fascinated by your comments about FDR, and, and I knew that. I didn't know Eisenhower had thought of the, the same thing. I think the You mean about uh, the realigning parties. the parties? Yeah, yeah, realigning the parties. I think the solution is uh, that that's already happening, and the solution doesn't work. It makes things worse. Uh, that we now have polarized parties, and, and that's one reason I think we have so much deadlock. Uh, 
you know, it's, it's going to be very difficult to change this filibuster process. Uh, and I'm sure John Bradhamus, when he was a member of the House, the House felt as frustrated then, although it was used much less frequently than it is today. Uh, and it's going to probably take years. One thing I'm certain of looking at California is that governing by supermajority is to not govern at all. Uh, I mean, if California, which is, you know, the, by depending on what year you're counting, the seventh, eighth, or ninth largest economy in the world, has a massive budget deficit because it requires a supermajority to pass a budget. It doesn't have a reconciliation process. So it doesn't even get to the beginning of this. I do not, I don't, and, and this is interesting because I, I hope when you write the epilogue you address this. It is not clear to me, and I would be happy to talk, by the way, about what I think liberals have missed in all this, but it is not clear to me that in the present situation with a conservative party, a Republican party that believes it is prospering by saying no, believes it is headed for victory by what you call in the book the power of oppositionism, uh, that that party is very interested in generating, rethinking its ideas or generating new ideas. And the, probably the one thing you said that I would be a little skeptical of is that the cultural issues have become less important. I don't think they're driving the Tea Parties, but I think they are part of this litmus test of a Republican Party of inquisition and purification that is going to find it very hard to embrace long term the changing, unless it loses, which right now it's not doing or it doesn't think it's doing, it em embraces the demographic diversity of America. You express the idea in the book, and I think you're absolutely right, that uh, conservatives should be embracing the idea of gay people wanting to get married and actually adopting a set of traditional values rather than the alternative lifestyle of you know, a generation ago. Uh, I, I, I find that almost inconceivable, at least for the foreseeable future, in a party where Lindsey Graham is not only in trouble, but, but Senator Bennett from Utah, who is one of the most conservative members of the United States Senate, is being challenged in his own party for renomination. Well, and also these, this uh, list of 10 principles the R that was presented to the RNC, I think, does include the Defense of Marriage Act. Right. I think it's one of them. Yeah. Ellen? So I wanted to acknowledge John Bradamus as well, the leader of our, the Bradamus Center for the Study of Congress, who must be very happy to hear your view that Congress is the dominant political force. But I ask you to talk a little bit about, uh, since we're at an undergraduate event here, um, the youth movement. So in your book, you mentioned that 45 years ago, the young intellectuals on the right um, channeled their energy into the political party, and the young intellectuals on the left channeled their energies into protest. And you talked about Kennedy having loosed uh, generational power, but then lost control of it. So I'd ask you to talk a little bit about the comparison to Obama and whether you think he's loosed a set of generational um, energy that he is also losing control of. And also just to reflect in general on the relevance of young intellectuals today on campus to um, what's happening. It's a great question about Obama. You know, Obama and Kennedy are parallel you know, a number of ways. Kennedy was also very viciously attacked when he was in office. I went back though and looked at the 1962 off year elections. The Democrats did very well. They lost just a few seats, right? Um, uh, one other thing, uh, uh, those are good questions. I want to get to them. J just to point out to, um, to reinforce Bob Shrum's point about uh, success in Congress. You know, Harry Truman got elected uh, partly in 1948 by attacking the Do Nothing Congress. The Do Nothing Congress, the 80th Congress, approved NATO, passed the Marshall Plan, and gave Greece to, uh, aid to Greece and Turkey during the Cold War. I mean, it had more accomplishments, and yet he could still uh, uh, attack it as, uh, you know, a lot of this was politics, but we can't imagine the Congress that would, that would act in that way now. You know, about, about the young, yes, one of the great contributions the right made to uh, modern American politics was to challenge dissident and dissenting energy into mainstream politics. When I quote, uh, uh, President Bradamus's article in uh, my book, what I say is he actually got it half right, um, that the left did move away from the Democratic Party, the young left did, but the, but the young right 
actually stayed within the Republican Party, and they did it by mounting a kind of insurgency. Um, they took over organizations that seemed insignificant at the time, like you know the Young Republican Group, you know, based in California, and yet they they made that and the Goldwater campaign the basis for future careers in politics, and they mastered the political system. Um, that was a virtue of their conservatism, was to think they should work through existing institutions. What first worried me about the Tea Party movement was that it seemed to be following, in some ways, the prescription of the new left. That is, the radicals who took themselves outside of our normal political channels and created a, a really a politics, a kind of anarchic politics. And it's interesting to see how now the Tea Party group, some of whom are on campuses, I was just looking this up the other day, to see if it was really a movement of the, of the middle-aged and elderly, or whether they're young people involved. And there do seem to be some on campuses. I don't know to what extent the ideas are coming from the young. Well, one of the interesting things about Buckley is he was well established as the leading conservative in America when he was in his early 30s. Now, partly that was just his brilliance, but it was also because it was a vacuum for him to fill, and conservative elders saw that he had